Okay. All right. Good morning to everyone and welcome to the Lord's house of worship where the people of God come together to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I want to welcome all of you, especially any visitors on this rainy day and uh, blustery. But uh, I welcome sometimes the coolness of the air because uh, those of you who stay here year round will understand that the summer times are very brutal with the humidity and the high heat. So uh, it's nice having low humidity instead. I want to also welcome those of you who are watching us on Zoom this morning. Uh, let's uh, say hello to them and always mean what we mean. We wave our hands because it is important to know that you are watching us and uh, hope that you can, uh, at your first opportunity, uh, join us in worshiping us and get to talk to us face to face. A number of announcements. Uh, one uh, reminder that this Wednesday at four o'clock, I'll be beginning the Bible boot camp, uh, improving your faith. And I hope that you can join us. Also, I think we will be uh, broadcasting that on Zoom. And if you're interested in uh, watching on Zoom, then uh, you can go to the worship on the website of our church's website. There's a section of worship services. Just press on that and it'll send you to the link for Zoom and then you can watch it. So those of you who are on Zoom today interested, you can just use the same process. Yes. The link will say watch Sunday service. Okay. Okay. So the link will say watch Sunday service. Use that one. Okay. Also, a uh, week from Wednesday at 4.30, correct? Ash Wednesday service. Oh, yeah. Yes. We, yeah, huh. That's a week from, not to be confused with Valentine's Day, <laughs> though it is the same day. Uh, so we will be having Ash Wednesday, uh, Ash, uh, an Ash service of uh, Ash Wednesday. February the 14th at 4.30, 4.30 right here in the sanctuary. So I hope that you can make it also for that. The 10th Avenue Thrift Store Palmetto Presbyterian Church in North River Pregnancy Center presents the second annual Spring Fling Fashion Show and Luncheon on February, Saturday, February the 17th. At, uh, it, uh, doors will open at 10 o'clock, but actually the luncheon will be and the, sh and the presentation at 11 a.m. The all proceeds will be going to support the, the local pregnancy center, the River Care Pregnancy Center. And I hope that you will uh, come and support that, uh, that ministry. It's a worthy ministry, one that saves the lives of unborn children and uh, and then maybe if the mothers cannot support and then encourage them to adopt. But uh, the lives of these precious loved ones are worthy of being saved. So come and join us for that. Finally, our uh, next Sunday morning, Jewel Tanner. Oh, it's Julie. Oh, without an eye. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, Jewel, okay. <laughs> Julie Tanner, who was a first chair cellist with Nashville Symphony, will be here to play with Karen for the whole service. How about that? Huh? And so hope that you can be here with us for that, to listen to this lovely music. So invite your friends and family. But I will also encourage you, along with that, to invite your friends and family to worship, right? Every week, invite them so that we can share the gospel with them. Again, we are grateful that you're here this morning. God loves you and wants you to be with him all the time. So this morning, remember to fill out the welcome pads and uh, let us begin worshiping our Lord. As forgiven people, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with all you all. And also with you. Please stand and let us greet each other in the name of the Lord.
As we are worshiping our Lord and have presented ourselves before him, it is humbling to know in our hearts that we as a people called by him to be a part of his family, the family of God, that in moments in our lives when we find ourselves doing something or saying some words that may hurt another, especially our Lord, that we can go to him every day of our lives, if not just once, maybe often, uh, many times during the day. Today, as a people of God, we join together to pray in unison to ask for his forgiveness. And our prayer today is adopted from Psalm 4. Let us pray. Answer me when I call to you, O oh, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long will humanity turn your glory into shame? How long will your people love delusions and seek false gods? In my anger, I have sinned, though you continue to search my heart for love. Forgive me, O Lord, and help me to follow your teaching and live a life that is pleasing to you so that your face may once again shine upon me. Amen. Hear the words of assurance taken from the scriptures. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please stand and let us sing a, a very strong hymn of worship. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, number three. Last week, I was asked the question, where did you find the statement of faith that was printed in our bulletins? And I, and I said in the prayer of confession, in, a, in our book of confession, but actually it's come from World Vision, though Christians around the world in different denominations do profess this very same confession, assurance of faith. It is a strong statement one that we must stand by, especially in the face of so many changes in our own culture and around the world. So let us confess our faith to one another and unto the Lord. Christians, what do you believe? We believe the Bible is to be the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. We believe that there is one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of Lord Jesus Christ, in his virgin birth, in his sinless life, in his miracles, in his vicarious and atoning death through his shed blood, in his bodily resurrection, in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and in his personal return in power and glory. We believe that for the salvation of lost and sinful man, belief in Jesus as Savior and regeneration by the Holy Spirit are absolutely essential. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit by whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a godly life. We believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost that they are saved, will be raised to everlasting life with the Lord, 
and they that are lost will be raised to everlasting separation from him. We believe in the spiritual unity of the believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Today's readings, one from the Old and the other from the New Testament, will reflect something about us and most importantly, something about the Lord. Take reading from Isaiah chapter 40, a great prophet of God who served during the kingship of Hezekiah, one of the descendants of King David. Hear the word of the Lord this morning as given to us in our holy scriptures. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Reading from the epistle to the Hebrews, first chapter. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is most excellent than theirs. This is the word of the Lord. We hear often these precious words God helps those who help themselves. Now, throughout history, men have achieved great things. If you've ever been to Cairo, there is a great demonstration of how, God, how man has achieved greatness. That is what we call what? The great pyramids, exactly right, that have endured for thousands of years. Maybe not perfectly the way they were constructed, but certainly magnificent. Then in India and Asia, you know that the Taj Mahal, many tourists go there and they, they wonder with great awe the beauty in, of, of that mausoleum. You travel to Rome, and you see the remaining buildings, and especially of the Colosseum. How were they able to construct such a magnificent arena of many floors? And it still stands to this day. What about those great artists like Leonardo da Vinci and his most famous work of the Mona Lisa. Yes, isn't it magnificent? And what about Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel? If you stare up there, stretching your neck, magnificent. And what about his sculpture, the Pietà? And I remember in 1964, when it was brought, or 1963, when it was brought 
to New York. And we saw it, I believe, at the New York World's Fair. I saw it years later there at the Vatican. Beautiful. What about the great works, writings that we have, like Shakespeare, the works of Dante's Inferno, or even later here in our American soil, Moby Dick. Huh? Great, great novels, great works, even ancient, in ancient days, the Iliad by Homer himself. Great achievements by humanity itself. Once again, let me reiterate those, that opening nine. God helps those who help themselves. Where do you think those words come from? I have heard that it comes from the Bible. Yes? Oh, no. It doesn't come from the Bible, does it? But I've heard many say, yes, it's from the Bible. But in actuality, is from ancient Greece and their teachings. It says, the gods help those that help themselves. The gods. So it's a very old saying. And I would say that it's not connected to the Bible or, or God himself. Instead, it's really connected, I dare say, to the evil one himself. Because this idea of wanting to stand on our own two feet is part of the original sin of trying to be God himself. John Calvin said this, it is the devil's word that exalts man in himself. It is the devil's word that exalts man in himself. Let us give no place to it unless we want to take advice from our enemy. And in Jeremiah, he says, to us in chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now, I will admit to you that humanity has done great things we have achieved magnificent works. I remember reading, uh, learning in my history class of the achievement of the building of the Hoover Dam, of the ton, thousands of tons of concrete poured to make that dam to stop the waters, I believe, of the Colorado River. I may be wrong here, but I think I may be right. What an achievement. Later, I believe it was the Russians that built even a larger dam for the Nile River. And the bridges spanning those great rivers. And some of you have traveled those bridges for miles and miles. I remember the first time I traveled the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. I thought I'd never get off of that bridge and its tunnels. Wonder. Great works. But the scriptures warn us clearly that we ought not to put too much credit upon ourselves because that's when we get in trouble. In the book of Isaiah, from the passage of scripture that I have just read, where it says, all flesh is grass, Isaiah was given these words by God to proclaim 
Not to weep. That's not the, what the word cry means here. Oh, oh boo-hoo. That's not what he's saying here. But to proclaim to the people of God a warning. Because just before these words were given, King Hezekiah, who had been ill, recovered and envoys from Babylon came to visit him, pay him a call. And they wanted to see how he was doing. Then King Hezekiah took it upon himself to give them a tour of the palace grounds, the temple, and all that was beautiful in the city of Jerusalem. Here, look, look at the many horses I have, the chariots like his father and Solomon, all the beautiful pal palace rooms, the palace, the temple, and the treasury. And when Isaiah heard this, he was disturbed. Could you imagine showing off all that you possess, but also your armament to protect yourself? And that's what, that's what he did for centuries later, as Isaiah would prophesy thereafter, telling King Hezekiah, what have you done? How dare you exalt yourself, thinking that you can protect yourself? thinking that you had control of yourself and the situation over the land, the Babylonians would come and destroy your land by the hand of God. And that's where these words come from and says to us all, all flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. Encouraging words, are they not? Yet we have to hear that from time to time to remind us that we're, we have to be knocked down. It, it is important to understand the point of the prophet Isaiah to us. I grew up in the little village called New York City. Some say I grew up on the wrong side of town. I grew up in the Bronx. Those who told me I grew up on the wrong side of town grew up in Brooklyn. So they followed the Dodgers and later the New York Mets. Huh? But I grew up a Yankee fan. I grew up during the days of Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle, Bobby Richardson and Tom Tresh, Elston Howard and Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, uh, Ralph Terry, Don Larson, Cleep Boyer. Who else was playing? Huh? Phil Rizzuto, yes. He was a little bit, I was, I was living, but I don't remember, I didn't have a TV, so I don't remember them. What did Yankee fans believe? We believed that we were the best. They had won the pennant after pennant, World Series after World Series. We had it all. Until 1963 when the Los Angeles Dodgers came into town and wiped us out off the face of the map. They swept us in four. Who was on their staff? Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. Boy, were they tremendous. It was humiliation at its finest. We were brought down. In a matter of speaking, God wants to shut us out. He wants to remove that which blocks our way to him. Because when we 
focus too much on ourselves and how, what we have achieved, how much we have earned, the beautiful things that we possess, the wonderful family that we have, and we revolve our world around those things, then he knocks us down. Because the truth is, well, let me read it to you. Verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Well, pastor, you must be talking about, yes, it will remain eternally. Unlike us, we're not going to live eternally. No, well, not like this. You're right. But the reason why he's telling us there is to turn our faces, our faith towards him because he is the source of our salvation. He is the source of our encouragement. He is the source of life in itself. There's no other. There is no other source to look upon and the word will stand forever. Jesus said that, that all that in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And that tells us that the richness of these words is what gives us life. When we read them in the morning, when we read them at night, it is a source of life itself. What is the word? The word is unchanging. It's trustworthy. It's reliable. It's pure. It's harmonious. It's life-saving, most loving. Its word is light against darkness. It is a revealing of the truth of Jesus Christ. It is God speaking himself to us. It is God speaking to us himself, to you. And that is what gives you and elevates you to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Where else will you find that truth? Where else? I cannot find it in any other book. And I have read the Iliad. How many of you have read, have read the Iliad? Homer's Iliad. Wonderful tale of war between the Greeks and the, and the Trojans. But it's not inspirational to me. It is not the word of God. It is not what Paul says in 2 Timothy, and this you know. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God. The word inspiration, Latin, for spirit in, in spirit, from the spirit. The word of God is given to us by the spirit. It is breathed out the life, the breath of life. His very words. If you turn to the Declaration of Independence, will it fill your heart like the word of God? Will it teach you about life through Christ? It does not. I mentioned Moby Dick. What a book. Chapter after chapter. Wonderful writing. Beautiful, colorful, prosaic, magnificent. But it doesn't fill my heart, my soul, my spirit with the inspired words from God. And it certainly doesn't teach me about Christ saving my soul.
The issue at hand is when we allow ourselves, our lives, our creations to get in the way, to get in the way of God for us. What he's asking us clearly here in Isaiah is this. This is what he's asking us to do. In humility, we are to find strength in him. And we find strength in him through his word. Jesus Christ came. He was revealed in these words to us. We trusted him to take us into his bosom and to save us from all of this life that we live today from preventing us from being his children. Isaiah has said to you, the flesh, all flesh is grass. Don't rely on yourselves to make your happy, to make your life happy and full of joy and peace. Do not, because you will fail, he says. You will fail. Instead, trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. This morning, as we prepare to receive the bread that represents his sacrifice body and his and the wine that represents his blood, I want you to give in to him this morning. Say, Lord, I repent. I repent that I have put matters, my personal matters before you. Whether they're, they're good things or they're sad things. And I have not placed them before you. Help me, Lord. Let me turn them over to you completely. Because that's what you're asking me to do. To rely upon you. Oh, yes. I believe it was Karl Marx who said that religion is the opiate of the people. That others would say, ha. Huh, it's just a crutch. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is a crutch. And it's a crutch that we need desperately. And the crutch is named Jesus Christ. When I take my last breath, I want to be able to say, Lord Jesus, thank you that I have relied upon you to help me through this life. This life is so short compared to what is to come, eternity. This life cannot even be measured in comparison to eternity. And we worry and we weep and we struggle mightily over this infinitesimal amount of time in comparison to our eternal life. Every one of you will live eternally. Every single one of you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. For he has called you to be his own forever. Lord, we are grateful. We're thankful that you have reminded us again that we really need you desperately. 
Help us to call upon your name every day of our lives, that the word of God is eternal. It is a source, it is the source of your love, spoken and written on our behalf. And that through these words, we learned about your son. He came, he taught. He suffered, he died, yet he rose in victory over sin, death, and the grave. Lord, have mercy, for you have seen it, you have given us eternal life. And Lord, if there's someone here who is struggling with that faith, who has rejected you all their lives, open up their hearts, melt their hearts, as you did with that one thief on the cross. At the very last moment, he said, yes, Lord, remember me as you enter into your paradise. Lord, hear our prayer today. In Christ's name, amen and amen. This morning, as we continue worshiping our Lord, we do it together as we share with our time, talent, and treasure. All offerings and gifts given us to be used for the ministry of this church, and we thank you, God thanks you. And so this morning, as we prepare to give, let us look to the Lord to guide you this morning. richness of your bounty, O Lord. You, you own the cattle on 10,000 hills, yet you share it with your people. May these gifts, O Lord, be offered to you in gratitude of the many blessings you have given us. May they be used for your glory. May they help the homeless and the needy and those without. We thank you again this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The prayers of the people of God are always noticed by the Lord. And so I invite you this morning as we share our needs with him. Is there anyone this morning that I need to pray? We need to pray this morning. Oh, Karen. Bless you, Terry. 
Yeah. Jim still has a long way to go. And there's, my friend Stephen Sandy again, um, 3C, he's having heart issues. All right, thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. This Friday? Is it? Is it? Uh, I think you told me last Sunday, but what hospital? Blake? Blake? Oh, Blake. Blake. All right. Friday. All right. Any others? Alan? Amen. Can't get enough about enough Bible study and and spiritual growth. Debbie. This is my stepbrother John uh, from the hospital being there for about two weeks now. They just transferred him over to Freedom Care for Healing for rehab, probably for another couple of weeks. But he is progressing from the surgery they did. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, may we pray together. Lord, our God, we have been brought again this day to worship you in spirit and in truth. Our knowledge does not encompass the whole universe like yours. Yet, you require us to pray for one another, to ask in order to receive. The answers will always come from you, not from us to you. We cannot demand, yet we pray in humble, with humble spirits. Lord, we thank you and we want to pray this day for Terry, Karen's friend, Steve and Sandy, and Tracy, another friend that is struggling with a heart condition. We want to pray for Judy, who will be having surgery this Friday. Lord, be with her, her husband. Stand with them and bring a spirit of encouragement and love and faith. We pray, O oh Lord, for spiritual growth as we continue to expand our faith, learning more about you in, in Bible study, in our Bible boot camp. Help us, O oh Lord, to strengthen our faith that we can stand against the wiles of the evil one, for he does want to dominate our lives. Yet, with your help, Lord, we will stand against him. We want to pray for Don, Debbie's stepbrother, who will be going to rehab. Let him grow stronger as others also will continue to receive your blessings. Each of us here this morning, O oh Lord, we ask that you'll help us in our path, our faith journey. Whether we're young or older, it doesn't matter. You look upon us the same. And so we as your sons and daughters, we beseech you to hear our prayer today and to hear the prayer that your son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord, centuries ago, knew that the end was coming for him. He knew also that moments after his supper with his beloved, that he would enter into utter anguish, knowing the pain that he was about to experience. Not more than 24 hours, less than 24 hours. But he went forward with it. He sat with his disciples and he introduced them to a new way of thinking about the Seder meal, a meal that had been celebrated for centuries after the Exodus, representing their, the people that escape out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and making it anew to represent the new escaped from the bondage of sin. So this morning as we celebrate and remember his death on the cross, that it is our exodus from the land of captivity. You as a believer in Christ are free by what Jesus did for us. And when we receive the waters of baptism to tell the world that we are Christians, that we trust in the one and only Lord, you are telling one another, this is your life. So this morning, I invite all the believers in Jesus Christ to join us. Those of you who are baptized and are believers of Christ to join us at his table. And so this morning, as we remember what the Lord did for us. And so on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do so in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took a cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant given for the remission of your sins. For as often as you drink it, you do so in remembrance of me. And so we continue to celebrate and remember the Lord's Supper, his death on the cross. And we will continue to do so until he comes back again. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving us your beloved Son, for whomsoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We are yours. And we, and we want to commune with one another to celebrate that we are yours. We are part of the family of God. But we are also given your spirit to celebrate this life, this eternal life, with each other, but with the whole world. To let them know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The table is open, and I invite our ushers to come this morning and to share to give.
of the bread and wine. And as they bring the bread to you, Please hold the bread until all have received and we will partake together. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, this is the bread of life given to us. This is the cup of the new covenant given to us for the remission of our sins. Let us drink together, remembering 
the Lord's sacrifice for us. We thank you again, Lord, for your love and your kindness. Through Christ, his name, amen. This morning, I was asked a question about <laughs> my faith. And uh, 51 years ago, in the uh, low hills of the Republic of the Philippines, is where <laughs> I rededicated my life to the Lord. It was a, a true experience for me. And ever since that moment, my life has been dedicated to serving him. I've read a lot of books, spent a lot of time in schools, like many ministers. Yet there's still always one book that I come back to. And it's the word of God. I do preach about it a lot. It's because it is, it is faithful. Especially in this day and age, isn't it? When things seem to be changing rapidly. Rely upon his word. It will give you strength. It will build your faith. Trust, in him, trust the Lord, for he is faithful to all of us. Our closing hymn this morning, number 406, Wonderful Words of Life. Please stand. As we leave, let us remember the words of our benediction. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. Believe this and go in the joy of God's power and love and grace.